Thank you very much. I was actually born here in New England, but I was privileged at a very young age to leave the United States and actually not come back until I was 16. And not only that, but I lived in a different country virtually every year. So constant exposure to new cultures and experiences. And early on, I developed an intense curiosity about the differences in cultures that existed around the world. And uh, spent a lot of time as a child trying to experience the different uh, countries that I was in. Uh, and then, unfortunately, school came in the way. Um, and I was introduced to school initially with kindergarten. I developed such an intense headache in that first day of kindergarten that my parents took pity on me and didn't uh, force me to go to the rest of kindergarten. But starting in first grade, I had to go uh, until third grade when I had a major realization, which was that I actually could forge my mother's signature well enough that I could write a note from her asking me to be excused from class so that I could go to the doctor's office. And uh, it worked extraordinarily well. In fact, I became known as the sickliest child in third grade <laughs> because of all these doctor's appointments that I had to go to. Uh, and what I did during that time, that free time that was creative for me, was at the time I was living in Caracas, Venezuela. And uh, very close to the school, actually, the slums of Caracas started. And I would go up into the slums and explore, spend the days exploring the slums. And I was really energized by the experience there because, contrary to what many people would believe, the slums are extraordinarily energetic places. Uh, there's a lot of sense of potential and possibility. Everybody has moved from the countryside into these slums. They made the choice to come in because they saw potential and possibility. And it was very interesting to me to experience that. I got hugely energized. Until one day, unfortunately, my mother showed up a little bit early uh, to pick me up at school and found out that I was at a doctor's appointment with her. <laughs> uh, and so unfortunately, that, that ruse ended. But I actually developed a skill uh, that served me well throughout the rest of my schooling, which was to accumulate degrees with going to as few classes as absolutely possible. Um, and in the, in the free time that that created, it allowed me to pursue a sequential set of experiences over time. I went from an interest in culture and national cultures around the world to an interest in market economics, to an interest in business strategy, and ultimately an interest in technology. Um, now, those seem like very broad and different domains, but there was a thread throughout that, which was this notion of looking for scalable potential and possibility ways that people could scale the potential and possibility that was available to them. And that's really been the thread throughout all my interests over, over my lifetime. Uh, and more recently, to come to today, I've developed a very strong interest in actually the notion of passion. And I say that with some trepidation because of all the reactions that that introduces. Uh, the first reaction when I talk to executives, I deal mostly with senior executives of large companies, um, the executives will ask me as I start to talk about passion, where are you from? And I'll tell them I'm from California. And they'll nod their head and say, okay, I understand. He's one of, the, <laughs> he's one of these new age types, you know, he's all interested in passion. Um, but actually, I came to the topic of passion through a different route, which was the notion that we got interested. I run a center called the Center for the Edge. Um, and we became interested in the notion of sustained extreme performance improvement. And we went out and looked around at a variety of arenas where you see sustained extreme performance improvement. One of the arenas we looked at was extreme sports. We heard this morning about skateboarding. Uh, we actually spent a lot of time with big wave surfing uh, to understand how sustained extreme performance improvement occurs there. We also spent time uh, actually in online gaming, particularly the World of Warcraft, where 12 million people come together on a regular basis to engage in this game, uh, as well as some business environments where you see sustained extreme performance improvement. One of the things we discovered, a common element across all those arenas, was that the participants in those arenas are deeply passionate about what they're doing. Now, the other problem with passion is that there are so many different meanings attached to passion. Saul mentioned earlier the whole notion of innovation becoming a buzzword. Passion has become a bit of a buzzword as well, and it's used broadly, 
but to my experience, without a lot of depth or real systematic understanding of what it means, uh, for many people it's just deep emotion, it's emotionally engaged. Um, we are actually starting to develop different uh, types of passion, uh, understanding different categories of passion. So there's one type of passion, which is the passion of the true believer. It's somebody who knows what the destination is, knows the path to get to that destination, and is deeply committed to going down that path. And anybody who doesn't want to help in that path, on that path, get out of the way. I don't want to talk to you, you're a distraction. I'm going down this path. I live in Silicon Valley. I'll say that many of the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley have the passion of the true believer. They know where they're going, and they're determined to get there. There's another kind of passion which I find more interesting, which is what I call the passion of the explorer. It's somebody who goes in and, for what, whatever reason, develops an intense interest in a domain, usually a pretty broad domain, but wants to really pursue that domain and make a difference in the domain. They're not just interested in reading about it or hearing about it. They want to participate. They want to engage. They want to make a difference. And they want to make a greater difference over time. They're constantly looking for this way to enhance their performance in terms of engaging with that domain. So it's a very different kind of passion that is driving those people. Now, pulling it back to a business context, how does, what does this mean in terms of business? Well, there are two things that we found that passion, the passion of the explorer tends to produce. One is what we call a questing disposition. It's the notion that, uh, think about the reaction an average person at work has when they confront an unexpected challenge. If you're not deeply passionate about the work you're doing, you tend to have a number of reactions to that unexpected challenge. On the one hand, your reaction is, can I ignore it? From previous experience, often these unexpected challenges just go away, so maybe if I ignore it long enough, it'll go away. Uh, if it doesn't go away, you try to paper it over, hide it, so nobody else can see it. If that doesn't work, you try to clue your way into addressing that unexpected challenge. But your key goal is to get back to your assigned tasks, because that's what you're there for. And that's the reaction of the, unex uh, the, uh, the person who lacks passion at work. Think about a passionate person confronting that unexpected challenge. Very different reaction. The reaction of that person is, Wow, that's really interesting. I've never seen that before. How would I tackle that? What would I do? Who can I reach out to? Who can I connect with to try to address that unexpected opportunity? And in fact, you find that really passionate people at work don't just wait for those unexpected challenges to come up. They go out and seek them. They want to find those challenges. They want to continually test themselves to see how they can get to that next level of performance improvement. So it's a very different kind of disposition in terms of how you react to unexpected challenges. There's a second element of the passion of the explorer, which is what I call a connecting disposition. It has to do with the notion of if you're really passionate about something, you have an instinctive desire to connect to people who either share your passion or can help you pursue your passion in some way. Passionate people are deeply connected. Some of the work we've done at the Center for the Edge shows that the passionate worker has twice as, is twice as much likely to have that questing disposition I talk to as an, a, a worker who lacks passion, and the passionate worker is twice as connected as the person who lacks passion. So if you're looking for sustained extreme performance improvement in work, that's an important attribute to have, to look for. And I'll, I'll just say, on a personal note, one of the things that is, has deepened my interest in this is I started, actually, when I was young, as well as that great experience living abroad, um, I had some traumatic experiences as a child, and it made me deeply shy. I found engaging with people to be very, very fearful. And so I avoided it as much as possible. But I was really passionate about the things I was interested in, and I found over time that the way I could express my passion was by writing. Writing was really interesting because I could express myself and connect, but without actually having that face-to-face -face connection. But what it turned out was that as I wrote, 
people started seeking me out. <laughs> people who shared my passion. And that was a really wonderful connection. And it increasingly over time reinforced that actually these connections are not something to fear. They're something to actually welcome and seek out. Um, and I found over time that the other interesting thing is it's not just about connection, it's about building long-term trust-based relationships. A couple of things happen if you're passionate about something. Number one, think about the people that you connect with that are passionate. I guarantee a couple of attributes. One is there's no facade. With a passionate person, what you see is what you get. They are not putting on a facade, trying to put up the strong face in terms of all the great accomplishments they've had. In fact, the passionate person expresses vulnerability very, very quickly. They, this very quickly in a conversation, they'll go to, my God, I'm really wrestling with this problem. I can't figure it out. I don't know quite how to tackle it, but it's really engaging. Can you help me? Are there ways I could think about this? They're expressing vulnerability. If you want to build long-term trust-based relationships, and you cannot express vulnerability to the people you're engaged with, you will not have that trust-based relationship. So passionate people are extremely well-positioned to build long-term trust-based relationships. And for reasons that I can't go into in the short time I have here, my belief is that's going to be increasingly central to success in business. Now, so passion is very, very powerful. Uh, it's also a problem in the sense that one of the pieces of research we've done is to look at levels of passion in the workforce in the United States. And what we found was that, on average, across the U.S. economy, only about 20% of the workforce is passionate about the work they're doing. The other 80% are not. And the level of passion is inversely related to the size of the institution. The larger the institution, the less passionate the workers are. And I don't think that's an accident. Again, for reasons I can't go into, I believe we live in an institutional environment that has been designed to squash passion. Not just our corporations, our school systems, our governmental institutions, all institutions. We have created a set of institutions that were designed for scalable efficiency, I think we are now in a situation where in order to succeed in a world of increasing pressure, and what do I mean by increasing pressure? We often talk about that. Another piece of research we did at the center looked at return on assets for U.S. companies over a long period of time, since 1965. Since 1965, return on assets for all U.S. public companies has collapsed. It's collapsed by 75%. It's been a sustained, Long-term deterioration goes beyond any economic cycle that we care to focus on. There is absolutely no evidence of it leveling off. There is certainly no evidence of it turning around. I think it is a huge indictment of the institutions we have. In fact, when I go into executive boardrooms, I'm struck by the increasing frequency with which I hear the Red Queen metaphor. You know, we feel like we're running faster and faster just to stay in the same place. It's horrible. Actually, the Red Queen had it really good compared to our U.S. corporations. The Red Queen ran faster and faster and stayed in the same place. We are running faster and faster and falling farther and farther behind. So I think that there's an opportunity here um, to really step back and rethink the institutions that we have, and try to figure out a different kind of institutional architecture. I mentioned before that the institutions we have today were designed for scalable efficiency. I think that what we need are institutions that are designed for scalable peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I think that's a different kind of innovation. From my experience, when we talk about innovation in the United States, often executives, almost always executives, will in very quickly narrow it down to product innovation or technology innovation. That's the only innovation that really counts. And if it's not breakthrough innovation, don't bother me. It's got to be breakthrough product or technology innovation. I think we have an opportunity to think about innovation at a totally different level, which is at the institutional level. 
and say, go back to the question of what is the role of an institution? Why do we have them to begin with? Famous economist won the Nobel Prize by saying that the reason we have firms is to reduce transaction costs, scalable efficiency. I think we need a new rationale for firms, and I think we need a new way of thinking about how you construct relationships across firms so that you get scalable peer-to-peer -peer learning. Thank you very much.